of how this works is that basically we're here for you. I'm going to be the conduit for your questions and, and bringing you people, very interesting people in the community like Dominic Luciano, our guest today. Dominic, thanks so much for joining us down here at your gym in Medina, talking gymnastics, past, present, future. Let's start with the past first. Mm -hmm. You won a gold medal at 14. Mm -hmm. When I was 14, I was trying to convince my mom to buy like Lucky Charms versus Cheerios. <laughs> that was my main, you know, concern. What what is it like to kind of, I mean, reach the top of your sport at that early of an age? Well, you know, I like Lucky Charms too, so <laughs> that's that's all you know in agreement here. Um, but reaching the pinnacle of my sport at just 14 years old changed the trajectory of my life. It yeah. changed everything about my life. I was not like the average 14 year old in school. I was a freshman in high school, 14 pounds, seven, you know, uh, 75 pounds, and four foot four. I was like so, so tiny, and it changed my life forever. I mean, we were part of something magnificent, not only for the sport of gymnastics, but for the landscape of the sport, because we were the first U.S. women's team to win Olympic gold. We had not been able to do that throughout history, and to be a part of history etched our names in, you know, stone essentially forever, and that that's something that I just carry with me um, deeply. Uh, it means so much to me now, uh, probably even more than it did then. Yeah. Do you ever look back at your childhood and go, I kind of wish I was going to the movies or, or do you wish the norm, the, you know, the normalcy of that? Or are you glad the way that, that you, I mean, you were a household name by 15. I was. And you know, I don't look back in the rear view mirror and say, I wish I could have this, that, um, it's just not life. Life is not working out that way. You know, you can't look back in the past and say, I wish, yeah, there are sometimes you have, you know, moments where you think about, I wish I could have done this or that, but honestly, you can't change the past. You can learn from it. Right. It's a part of who I am. It's a part of what I've done, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, the positive. It is part of, you know, who I've become today, all of it. And so I don't look back and have any regrets. Sure. Did I give up a childhood? Absolutely. But did I get to go around the country and travel like a rock star in a tour bus when I was 15 years old? Yes. And so did I get to go to the White House? Did I get to meet Oprah? Yes. I got to do things and meet the president of the United States. I would never have had that opportunity had I just, you know, been eating my lucky, lucky charms. <laughs> but, you know, but I actually still got to do that and, and have fun, too. So anyway, it paid off is, is my moral of the story. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it all paid off. You talk about, I mean, really blazing the trail there for uh, the gymnastics team. Why were the Russians so good? Back <laughs> then, they were on the top of their game. What was it that they were doing differently? I think it was their centralized system. You know, they take the kids and they pluck them from very, very early from their parents, and they train in a centralized government-run system where they get the best physiques, they get the best mindset, They just like they do in China currently. So they just pluck them from their parents and then they live there. They go to school there, they train there, they become a family there, and that's it. And they see their parents once or twice a year. Well, you can't do that in the United States. Right. And I don't know if you want to, you know? So for so many years, that was the system we were fighting against, just like in hockey. Just, you know, they have these sports where they were just so intense. And they also had coaches who had the knowledge that weren't just gymnastics coaches, but they had physiology. Um, they had anatomy. They had courses in how to become a coach. And it was much more depth there in their training philosophies than we had here at the time. And so we were just playing catch up for so many years. We didn't really have those philosophies and the deep roots of how to train these athletes to become their best. Yeah. We had kind of surface knowledge. We didn't have that depth. And so I think over the years, that's why they became so good. And a part of it was that centralized system. But we proved in 96 that you don't have to have a centralized system. We could do a semi-centralized where we kind of meet up at, you know, these national teams. But we didn't do that then. But we had some national team, you know, trainings together. But it wasn't like it is now where they go every month. So we could prove that even with our American way, our system, we could still do it. And I think that's what we have a lot of pride in. You go back to, like, the Olympics, 96, but mm -hmm. even to now, USA, US, the, the cheers. And then now you see it, I mean, on Congress floor. I mm -hmm. mean, it's become a chant. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that weight when you're out there? I mean, the patriotism is through the roof during the Olympic period. Do you mm -hmm. feel that, you know, the entire country behind you at that point? Well, especially because we had it in the United States. Yeah. That was rare. And um, I was fortunate 
to have it in the United States, but it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Here you have this insurmountable amount of pressure. And then you have on the other side, all of the support came to us. And so that was really awesome. And then the Russians were complaining about it because they're falling off the beam and saying that they were cheering too loud for the Americans because it was the home crowd. I said, well, that's the home court advantage. You got to get used to that if, you know, if you're competing. But that is the advantage when you have a home meet. Yeah. So we had obviously a lot more pressure because it had never been done. But we also had the hometown support, which was also you know, phenomenal because it helped us in the adrenaline rush. And the chanting and cheering of USA is something I'll never forget. Anytime I hear that, I get goosebumps. I get chills even now talking about it because it is so powerful when you're in that moment and you hear it. And every time you hear it, you feel that just overwhelming sense of pride and patriotism that you know you did something for your country. That was really, really awesome and something that had never been done. And forever, that will be a, a mark in history that we were a part of. And I can share that with my grandkids one day. I want to jump in uh, online here real quick and get an idea of some of the questions that are coming in. Um, you look at the, the Olympics right now. Everything kind of changes, right? Sports change. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between your routines in 96 and what they did in Rio, for example? Right. So uh, every four years within the quadrennium, there's lots of rules that are shifting and changing and adjusting. And after every Olympics, there's a big cycle of changes that come through again. You have to adjust your routines. The coaches have to analyze the code of points. You have to see what's going to benefit your athlete and not. But the biggest change since 1996 is they removed the compulsory competition completely. Really, when you set gymnasts side by side and they do the exact routine, you really know who's the best from the best yeah. because there's no cheating it's in those apples routines. To apples too. Right. There's no cheating in those routines and you can't cut corners. Like you can't just do an optional routine. You can do whatever advantages the gymnast best. You can create the routine with all of their strengths. In compulsory, it was clean slate for everybody and they were hard. They were hard, but they really defined us um, in such a different and unique way. I know that people got bored of seeing the same routines and same music over and over and over. But that was what was so beautiful about the compulsory competition. It was because you had this completely different set of routines, but everybody did it. So you could compare who was really the best of the best in these routines. And it also made us finesse more. It focused on the details and the polish. And I miss that. Rather than chucking and just doing those high level skills, but it doesn't matter how they look. To me, I'm more an aesthetic and, and traditional gymnast. I like that appealing, you know, beauty, but if you can combine beauty and strength, that's where you got the complete athlete. And I love seeing that. I always stress to my kids that I coach, it's about the form, it's about the details, it's about the basics, and you have to spend so much time there. That's why we love the compulsory competition. Not that we love the routines, but we, we those routines were very hard and we all dreaded them in the morning. We're like, <laughs> oh no, six beam routines, it's eight in the morning. But that's what made us good. And so now that that has been eliminated and also the age requirement has been eliminated. I was the youngest Olympic gold medals for US gymnastics history. That can no longer, you know, be challenged. After the 96 Olympics and into the 2000 Olympic Games, they changed the age requirement for gymnastics. You have to be 15, turning 16 at the end of the Olympic year cycle. So by December 31st, you have to have a birthday that's, you know, within that time frame and to meet the age requirements. I was the last four 14 year old for the US and so that's another big change. So those I would say are the biggest changes and then the code of points eliminating the 10, oh, that's the third. So these three monumental changes change the sport dramatically. You have an open-ended scoring system now. You, these people don't understand what does a 16 mean? What does a 15 mean? Everybody knew what the 10.0 was. Right. It's iconic. The collegiate gymnasts still have it on the women's side but not on the men's side. So it's very confusing for some fans who kind of, you know, chime in for, to watch gymnastics every now and then, but they're not adamant followers. They kind of lost a little bit of like, what does this mean? We still love the sport. We love to see it. It's amazing, but we don't really understand the scoring system. But now they're starting to a little bit. The commentators are trying to explain it. Um, but I still think that icon for our sport is the 10.0. Right. I mean, that's what defined us. Now you have difficulty and then you have you know, your routines that have to match up with, you know, you have a 10.0 out of like the form and, you know, those kinds of deductions are still out of a 10.0 execution. But then you have an open-ended score system where you can rack up the difficulty 
and you can win the meet before it even starts if you have a high enough start values and you can win with a fall and you can win with two falls sometimes you know and for an average viewer that's hard to, to it's figure hard out. to accept that you know you can still win with a fall if you deserved it great by all means it's fine but they're doing harder routines because of that everyone is trying to ramp up that difficulty and sometimes it's lost its polish and for me that's something that aesthetically, if you can't do the skill and do a big skill and do it cleanly, I don't think you should be doing it. Yeah. But that's me. That's someone who's been in the sport their whole lives, who has a different attention to detail than most people. So there's been a lot of changes. Yeah. I want to jump back here online. Uh, viewers asking your philosophy, uh, such a breath of fresh air, helps them believe in themselves. That comes from Jacqueline. Uh, facility is great. Looks like you have the equipment for uh, future champions. Uh, talk about your training a little bit um, compared to this type of training. Oh my goodness, it's night and day. I mean, I trained eight hours a day. Um, you know, went to school in the middle of the day, got out early because I didn't need a PE class, so they would let me leave class since I was training all the time. But it was much more rigorous, much more stern and strict, and emotionally and verbally abusive. Where you know now I'm I'm nurturing. All these kids who are coming from toxic environments and toxic gyms and, and unhealthy you've kind of been gyms. the face of that right now. You, I mean, before this, the whole Nasser thing came right. out. Before that, you came out and <laughs> talked about physical and emotional abuse. What? Nobody jumped on your corner though. You were on an island. I was all alone. Well, it was awful. It was a terrible time because for the last almost decade, I was alone with this topic. Yeah. Everybody just abandoned me. They blacklisted me. I wasn't uh, invited to appearances anymore. Literally, my life changed. My friendships disseminated. I had nobody stepping up. And I'm like, you guys know this is happening. Why are you hiding behind it? You guys are supposed to be my friends. Can't you just acknowledge that you know that it went on? You don't have to jump in my court. I'm not asking you to support me, but can you just acknowledge that it happened? Yeah. I didn't ask anyone to come in with me. That's why I was alone out there as an outlier for so long. And I'm talking to these athletes behind closed doors. I'm like, you guys know exactly what happened. Why can't you just say, yes, she's speaking the truth instead of throwing me under the bus when you know we can make a difference? This is not okay. And I stood out there and I took the heat and I took the arrows and I can't tell you how many nasty emails and messages because social media was just starting right. to get a little bit big at that time. I got so much hate and on Twitter and calling me some kind of attention seeking person, but in other words, a um, lot of nasty words. But, you know, it was just unbelievable to me how these people could attack me so rigorously when they had no idea what was happening inside the gym. They don't know. They weren't between those four walls. They weren't there. And what did I have to gain? Nothing. I lost almost everything. I lost sponsorships. I lost everything. I lost friendships. I mean, and it really showed me who my real friends were. Yeah. And only after eight years, I think the Houston Chronicle, my hometown paper in Texas, finally in 2017, almost nine years actually, finally said a headline that said Mochiano Vindicated. And it was like, how did that feel? Oh, it was like I could breathe again. I just felt this unbelievable amount of pressure because I had all these women coming to me at this time, all the abused women from that Nassar victims, and I was helping them. It was emotionally so draining. I had already been through eight years of being alone on this island talking about this, and it wasn't the sexual part, but it was all the other abuses that allowed the door to open for the more egregious acts to happen. But when you talk to the athletes, so many of them are like the emotional and verbal part is what destroyed me in a lot of ways because it opened the door for other things. And so when to, I- To somebody mm -hmm. that hasn't been in a gym, mm -hmm. um, give me an idea on what uh, the emotional and physical abuse, like what, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Especially to someone young like that. I mean, yeah. that you're supposed to be in the care of someone that is caring about you. Exactly. An adult that knows better. Right. I mean, how do, you, how do you take that in? Well, it's, I mean, it's heavy because if you speak up, it's you're a sign of weakness like you're not allowed to say anything you speak up and you try to tell your coach hey i'm hurting no you're supposed to deal with the pain and push through the pain and col i collapsed in the gym you know when i was injured and my coach grabbed me by my neck and just kind of shoved me to the phone go call your parents like like i was less of a human because i was hurting and i couldn't say anything until i collapsed and even then you treated me like less of a human being because i'm 14 years old and i don't know who to turn to you're not believing me so who do I go to? It's before the Olympic Games, you know? Do I keep going? Obviously, this is my dream. I'm not going to stop now because I was so mentally trained to be so tough. Yeah. And it and it helps me today. 
to go have gone through those 10 years of being, you know, thrown those arrows and stones and everything, it helped me. But I mean, I'm human too. It hurts, you know, it hurts. And at that time when you're so young, it hurts your self-esteem. You know, after I won the gold, I thought it was going to be completely different. My life was changing. And, but I felt empty inside because of how much they destroyed my self-esteem and self-confidence every day telling me I was fat in the gym if I didn't perform up to their standards. Every day it was always a mind game if, you know, if you had too much water and your bar routine wasn't going great, it was like, oh, it was because you were fat. It wasn't maybe because, hey, maybe we're a little worn out. Maybe you're just overtraining us and that's why I have a stress fracture and that's why I collapsed in the gym. It wasn't ever their fault. It was always the athlete's fault somehow. So we couldn't speak up. And so that cycle affects your, your brain, affects how you think about yourself. You're going into the gym terrified. And on top of it, I had another layer of an emotionally abusive tactic where my coach Bella would threaten me to call my father so he could enforce physical punishment on me if I didn't perform. So every time I was like, scared walking in the gym, the kids walk in here, they're dancing, they're having fun. So the big difference in the way I teach them, they're like, we would never be able to dance and I could never show my personality at my old gym. And I'm like, why not? You're 11 years old. It's okay to, you know, some girls are just going like this dancing and looking in the mirror and I'm just laughing. I'm like, you guys, we work hard here, we train hard, we expect a lot, but I also let you be who you need to be. Yeah. And I think that's something that we had to hide and always shove down our personalities to be like soldiers, you know, and we were just kids. We didn't need to be soldiers, you know what I mean? There's a place for that. So I think those kinds of things shaped me into how I want our gym environment to be, and that's why this place means so much to me and why I have so, heart, so much heart in, you know, how these kids are treated. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, they need to walk away with higher self-esteem and people that believe in them, not treat them like they're garbage. And so many girls have emailed me and their families and they're like, we need to change the environment. Our gym is just really bad. And it's still existing today because I'm getting emails. But I also got some hate mail from gym owners in the local areas. They're threatening their, their gymnasts that if they come to our camp, they're going to kick them out of the gym. And I say, that's ridiculous. I say, we're a community here. And it's local gyms, it's surrounding gyms. That when I opened, I got two really, really nasty emails from gym owners. And I, I thought- Because they thought you were going to turn poach their- Poach them. Oh. Yeah, poach their athletes somehow. But some of them, they all came here willingly. I never poached anybody. They've all come to me saying, I need a different environment because I'm mistreated. And some girls got kicked out of their gym when they found out they were coming here. I mean, there's a whole saga behind all of this. but. I said, if they're in a better environment and they're healthy and they're happy, you know, they're customers. It's their choice. Yeah. You can't, you don't control them. And you can help them and guide them and be their coach for them for that time period. And sometimes, you know, you part ways and, and it hurts. And But if they're finding another place that's better for them, then you know what? Then that's where they need to be. Right. And it's not my fault. <laughs> How do you get that attitude to USA Gymnastics? I mean, right now... I mean, you look at it as a former insider to that, now on the outside, mm -hmm. uh, uh, organization that's filed for bankruptcy. They've had four people running it in the last, what, two years, right. and now they're on their fourth. Yep. How do they straighten that out? How do they get uh, the, the confidence of, of, of gymnasts again, the, the American public again? Mm -hmm. Where do they go from here? You know, I've said this for a while now. I mean, you have to first settle with the victims. I mean, you really want to show that they're important and all that has happened is not in vain. You have to settle with them. You're filing bankruptcy. Obviously, we knew that that was going to take place because the financial, you know, the financial strain of all of this is that it is going to deplete it. it, it there is no way you can sustain it. You still have members' dues and all of that. You have to pay those to, to be a part of the organization. But, I mean... Obviously, through bankruptcy, they can rebuild still. It doesn't mean it's, it's the end, but it has to dissolve a little bit in order to rebuild. And I would say just rebuild by being honest and transparent and having a much more transparent system that is helping the athletes and showing that they care and they're not just a number. Um, for so many years, it was like Steve Penny was, he was a crook. I mean, so many years. I, I mean, I'm just waiting for the hearing here to happen because I, I'm almost positive there's got to be something there where there's smoke there's fire i mean for so many years he did so many corrupt things and i could not stand that guy i mean i i just from the moment that 
he would always just be so slimy. And I didn't like that at the top of our organization, that there are all these people that were somewhat shady and slimy, that it, you can't have good leadership when you have that. And over time, it showed. And it showed how corrupt he became. I mean, there's a lot of stories I could tell you. But, well, I can save that for another day. But, um, but I think the best thing moving forward for USAG is obviously to start fresh and, and try, try to, to build from the ground up from the ground up you have to get rid of people who were part of the old system who you know they were brainwashed into thinking that this was the only way to win and you know they're trying to get new people in there they're trying to get some good people in there so i think time will tell you have to prove it with action talk is cheap yeah. you know we've done we've talked i've talked but i put my plan in action for so long i've, I've said things and now i wanted to be part of that change and we're part of the new wave of the new generation to help these kids have healthy experiences because they deserve that. I'm going to jump back online here and uh, and take a look and see if there are any more questions here coming in. Um, this one comes, how big of a market for gymnastics is there in Northeast Ohio? Oh, it's huge. You have thousands of little girls and boys doing gymnastics. I mean, Ohio gymnastics is big. High school gymnastics is huge. We're going to start really um, opening up more high school because we have high school gymnastics here. They train with their, you know, their high schools, but they come here to get the extra training that they, they need on safe equipment and pits so that we can save their bodies longer term. So we're in that, you know, in that market as well. We want the kids to do the sport as long as they can and love it and enjoy it. But also you learn so much from this sport because sport is a small model for life. Yeah. It teaches you discipline, hard work, teamwork. And sometimes it's not all about yourself, but you work as a team. And I always encourage our kids, cheer for one another, be happy for one another. If someone's doing something, you be happy. It'll be your turn one time for someone to cheer for you to be happy for your skill. There's no jealousy. Don't, don't create that kind of environment. You want, to, you want everyone to be happy for each other because that's how you create a healthier environment. But in, in the elite world where we were in, it was always like vicious. No, you want to be competitive, so, so viciously competitive. did you competitive. talk to the other gym, or were you guys kind of more? It was more like this. We did our own yeah. kind of model. We, you know, people were just, they don't understand what our model is. But we're just doing it what I believe is right. And all these years, my husband and I have spent in the gymnastics world. I mean, between the two of us, we have 60 plus years of experience. And I'm not that old, so you know I've been around a long time in this sport, and I know a lot about it, but I'm always wanting to learn more. I think that's also what is very important for moving forward is the continuing education process and how to educate our staff and educate our athletes and coaches and how to approach teaching because there's so many new ways. There's science involved as well. We need to get more science involved because so much wear and tear on the body, you know, eventually it starts to deplete, and we got to – Make sure that these seasons are not so long for the kids. Their bodies are just deteriorating. We need to try to keep them in one piece when they walk out of here. And it's tough because the gymnastics does some wear and tear. But yeah. if we're you know, smarter about it, we can try to do less pounding and you know, peak when we need to peak and rest when we need to rest. So there's that, that factor as well that I try to think about. And my husband being a physician and surgeon, you know, he knows about that science better. And he can take care of all of our kids injuries below the knee that's his specialty so he always takes care of the kids to make sure you know you never had a doctor that actually can do gymnastics in his 40s still and you know what I mean so he has a different perspective of what it feels like how fast the recovery time can be and he knows the sport so if you tweak your ankle he knows exactly what skill if you say double twist or triple twist oh yeah I know what that skill is you know as opposed to someone who may not understand and it might be you know, twice as long of a recovery for someone who doesn't understand the sport just because they want to play it extra safe. Right. But at a high-level athlete, you want to get back. So so there's those um, benefits that we have here at our you know, program, too. You mentioned you spent, I mean, you spent your entire life in mm -hmm. the gym. Mm -hmm. And you're still in the gym. Mm -hmm. If it were not for gymnastics, what would you be doing right now? Oh, good question. I don't know. I have an entrepreneurial spirit. I would do something entrepreneurial based. Um, I just feel like I've always been driven that way. Maybe it's, you know, because of my dad. Um, he was a pioneer. He was he immigrated here and fled from the communist country of Romania when you know, Ceausescu's regime was very powerful and very strong. Uh, when he fled here, he left through Austria and just kind of, boom, came over and you know, eventually my mom, he went over to get my mom and brought her over. And so I'm first generation here, you know, I'm living the American dream. So I think 
no matter what, I feel like I would have been an entrepreneur uh, in one way or another. I just don't know yet where that would have taken me, but because gymnastics was such a big part of my life and my parents introduced it to me when I was very young, um, it's always been a big part of my, my heart. But there was a time, I can tell you that my self-esteem was so shot after the Olympics that I didn't even want to watch gymnastics. And that's how many of these gymnasts who were abused, um, that's what happens to them is like, I don't eat, thanks to my husband, he brought me back in because there was a time where I was like, I don't want to watch Distancing it. Distancing yourself. I don't want to do it. People in there treated me so badly. Like every time I went back, I always felt like that was a part of me felt that like that feeling of them just eyeing me, telling me I was too fat and I'd gained so much weight. And I was just less of a human being because I'd grown up and I wasn't this small 14 year old, 75 pound little girl anymore. I was a grown woman and they would just look you up and down and be like, ugh. So disgusted because I wasn't in te- you know tip top shape, and I'm like I don't need that in my life. Right. I got to a point where I'm like I don't need these people. Like I don't even like these people. So why am I going to hang around them and be forced in a room with people that treated me so badly? And I stopped being fake. I stopped playing the game. Nobody liked that, and so I started to get pushed out. But I was like, what am, what am I here for? I don't need to be pretending like I'm friends with you, Marta and Bella, when all you did was destroy me. Like what what good does that do? That's not good for me as a young woman to set an example for my children one day either. I've got to grow my own confidence and I'm going to say stop, enough of this. I'm not going to play your game and pretend that we love each other and you know put on this act when I know very well what you did and the things that you've done and I'm not going to stand for it anymore. So You, you came out um, against the coaches about mm-hmm. physical and emotional abuse. Right. And you were very instrumental in talking uh, the Nasser uh, gymnast to come out about him. If someone's watching right now that is suffering from some sort of abuse one way or the other mm-hmm. in the world of gymnastics, what do you say to them? What did you say to these girls that came to you about Nasser? What did you say to yourself when you were thinking about coming out? How do you help someone now? What would you say? Oh my goodness. Well, when I was coming forward, I remember it so clearly. I was doing HBO Real Sports in 2008. I was sitting there and I was with my husband. And I sit there in the bathroom, I was freshening up. I said, am I going to do this or not? It's going to change my life. I said, people are going to attack me. You know, I started listing off all the things really quickly about how this was going to have some repercussion and backlash because it always did. Anytime anybody spoke up and some people tried in their own way, but you know, I was doing it on a pretty huge platform and I immediately did get attacked, but I knew that going in and I was like, Mike, should I do it? Not. He's like, you know, do it. It's okay. And he was the one, my husband was the one who encouraged me. Had I not said that and he, he encouraged me to say something, I would have been still very nervous too, because that was a culture we were raising. Like you can't say anything about that stuff, but I'm like, when they wronged us, why is it wrong for me to say the truth? And so it started to play it over and over and, and I did it and I said it. And after that time, you know, I've had many years to kind of think about it and continue the battle. And when it was time for the women to come to me and talk to me, I remember distinctly, had Jamie Dancher not talked to me about this, I'm like, Jamie, this is wrong. Like, I remember coming back home to Cleveland, picking up the phone, calling her, and I said, you have to report this. I said, how many people has this happened to? She's like, well, listed off a couple of gymnast names that we knew at the elite level. And she's like, but I'm asking more. I said, you have to report this. I said, you cannot let this go unchecked. I said, what he did was so wrong on so many levels. And it's illegal. And I mean, not only is it that, but it's so much more. And I said, if he did it to you guys, he did it to others. And I said, please, whatever you do, please report this. Please go to the police because there's no way he's going to get caught if we don't do something about it. And so... I didn't know if they would listen because, you know, they have to come to terms with that. They have to come to terms with coming forward, and that's scary. And I kept telling that to each person that came to me. Honestly, I was getting messages on Facebook and email nonstop. I was, like, emotionally drained every night for a while because I kept helping and, and talking to people. It just took every ounce of my strength, but I did something good, and I did something good for them, and I think had Jamie not done that, this NASA story may not have come out in the way it did. So she took action after that, and I put her in contact with the right people, put her in contact with the president of a nonprofit organization that deals with sexual abuse and all types of abuses, and they train people, and, and I put her in contact with her because she actually was a survivor as well. Yeah. So they could have a, a dialogue about that 
and then I said, please, you know, here's what I can offer you. This is what my knowledge is about this topic is you have to report it. This is what I feel is right. I know that you will feel better once, you know, you take this path, but here's another person you can talk to who actually has experience. And I would always direct people to get guidance and help to help the trauma and help the psychological and emotional state they're in because I could, I could do so much and then I have to pass on to a professional. And so that was kind of, I felt like a liaison in all of this. Like yeah. it, it was just, I was directing the path to help get them where they needed to go. Um, and I can't tell you how many numerous emails and calls and people like, I'm a victim too, I'm a victim. And it was overwhelming. It was just for me, it was just like, they trusted me. And I'm, that meant a lot for them to trust me in that way, to reveal those things to me. And I just, I just think I played my part. I just did what I had to well, you, do. I mean, you jumped out, you, you helped them, you jumped out uh, in Congress and testified, mm. and you were very instrumental in getting that, um, that, that law that passed mm. yes. uh, to try to keep sports safe. Mm -hmm. Do you want that to be your legacy or the gold medal, if you had to choose? Honestly, um, the gold medal was a stepping stone into all that I'm doing today. I think it's a much larger impact. Um, and so I think my legacy will hopefully be that I helped a lot of people and I did a lot of good. That's what I care more about. Did I help people? Did I do good on this earth when I lived here in the, li the years that I had to live? Whatever I'm allowed to live, I just want to make sure that I do good. I think you're doing great. This is a fantastic uh, gym behind us. I was here for the ribbon cutting. <laughs> Uh, success so far year one uh, what's anything big coming down the line here at the gym yeah our one year anniversary May 30th so we hope to have a nice little little you know celebration and we just are starting camp season soon so we're getting lots of kids and lots of Olympians and gold medalists friends coming in so if you want to come out and join us don't be afraid of your gym gym clubs kicking you out I think that's ridiculous come join us it's a family friendly environment and, you know, if they kick you out, we'll have some words with them. Last question for you. Your gold medal right now, yes. where is it? My gold medal is actually finally after 18 years of keeping it under my <laughs> bed in a safety deposit box. Well, not safety deposit, but like a lock and a fireproof box. Um, I finally just took it out and put it in a case. Okay. I created a case at our new home when we moved about almost five years ago and finally put it up. But 18 years, I... I had it, held it in a fireproof box under my bed. And I always feel like as a kid, like as an adult, you yeah. put it away. But as a right. kid, you almost want to wear it to like Giant Eagle to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Did you ever funny. do anything like that when you were younger? No, I felt too embarrassed to wear it anywhere other than when I was like where I was supposed to. Um, but yeah, I was like, no, I'll just keep it in its little box and container. So. Still safe. Dominique, yeah. thanks so much thanks. for joining me. Thank you for being a part of Let's Be Clear. Hey, thank you so much. That was thank